Listen, he is worthy. What, what an amazing Savior Jesus is. I've been walking with him for like 43 years, something like that. And I still am constantly in awe. Um, my main place to read and study is our kitchen table. I end up a lot of places, but that's sort of my go-to place. I open up my Bible and I pray and I read and I cry. And I read some more and I cry some more. It's a pretty typical thing and I've been doing it for over 40 years. I just, I can't get over yeah. how amazing, how real our Savior yes. is. He's yes. fantastic. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you tonight. We thank you for your people. We thank you for the church, how we love the body of Christ. And Lord, we know we're in the kingdom for such a time as this, when the world is filled with such turmoil, when there's such division in our own country. You've called us to be a light. You've called us to be healers and those that reconcile those that lift up the light of the gospel in a very dark world because, Jesus, we realize that ultimately you are the only hope for our country and for our world. The problem is the human heart, and you alone can change that, Jesus. We just thank you for moving in our midst by your Spirit, and, Lord, we pray that what you do in here, what you do in us does not stop here and does not stop with us, but that it carries on through us in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, with our families, to, to those that we meet, Lord, may it, it just spread in an, at an unprecedented rate. We love you, Lord. We want to see revival. We want to see your spirit move. We want to see your name elevated and lifted high. We love you. Lord, we ask you to speak to us through your word tonight. We ask it humbly and expectantly. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Go ahead and take a seat if you would. We've got quite a few people joining us via live stream from across the U.S. I've got a list. There's a whole bunch of states here. Uh, people who watch us want to welcome you as well as we've got people from Canada, China, Germany, France, the Netherlands, and Mexico all tuning in to our Wednesday night Bible study. Welcome. Good to have you with us as well. Um, we're on a series dealing with the subject of angels and their ministry. Um, this is our second installment, and we'll actually be on it for the next three Wednesdays in a row. And I feel like we're just sort of scratching the surface. I've had to condense some things, and I, I actually may end up throwing one of the messages on a weekend. So we may go four more uh, lessons dealing with the ministry of angels and not just the three after this one. But just by way of review, we found that angels are created beings that are generally invisible to the human eye, but from time to time they do materialize in human form. And some people just think, well, that's a fairy tale. They're not real because we can't see them. Oh, wait a minute. You can't see the wind but it's real. You can feel its effects. I mean, right now in this room, presently, there are invisible pictures flowing through the room. There's words flowing all around you, invisible television signals and internet signals and radio signals. I mean, there's pictures in here, but our ability to perceive reality is limited. And I think people know that, you know, that those pictures are there and just be able to need to be able to tune in. Well, friend, angels are the same way. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean they're not a part of reality. They are here. Um, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 were sort of pivotal verses last time. Um, these verses in the previous ones, the writer of Hebrews makes a comparison of the superiority of Jesus to that of angels. And he says in verse 13, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? 
are they, that is angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Right? Angels, they're ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those that will inherit salvation. My friend, that's you and that's me. Those that have been embraced Christ, we have inherited salvation. And literally the angels are sent to assist, to help, to care for, to render service for the heirs of salvation. We also read last time Psalm 91, and I want to go over these verses. Verse 3 and verse 4, it says, Surely, Psalm 91 and 3, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Now, some people feel that this protection he's talking about here when he talks about under the, the shelter, under his feathers, the shelter of his wings, is actually talking about angelic protection. And the reason for that, the next few verses, verse 9, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Promised angelic protection. We looked last time in Genesis 48 as Jacob has Joseph and Joseph's two sons by his bed as Jacob's getting ready to die and he's blessing his son and blessing his grandsons. And he refers to the angel. He says, the angel that has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Other translations say this angel delivered him, kept him from all harm. Talks about a specific angel, and we looked at the reality that that, that quite possibly was a guardian angel, a personal angel, and we, we looked at some things that Jesus said last week about that. Psalm 34 and verse 7 an often quoted scripture says, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Literally, the angel forms a circle of protection round about those that fear the Lord and delivers them. My wife and I had some very dear friends, Norman and Billy Gordon, and uh, Norman was an evangelist and Norman's been in heaven for a long time, and I, I'm quite sure Billy's probably there as well. They were up in age when we knew them, and that was before we started Cottonwood Church 36 years ago. And uh, Billy tells the story how she was driving with her 10-year-old son. They lived out in the country, and she said, honestly, I was driving a little faster than I should have been. And some of these, these bridges out in the country they're so narrow, if there's two cars coming, you have to stop and let one car pass because it's not wide enough for two cars to pass. And she's coming up to one of those bridges, traveling a little faster than she should have been, and when the headlights hit that bridge, there was a red bull, a big reddish-brown colored bull standing sideways in the middle of the bridge. No way to get around it. She didn't have time to brake. She just gripped the steering wheel, closed her eyes, and got ready for the impact and said, Jesus, and nothing happened. She opened her eyes, and they're on the other side of the bridge driving, and she just thought to herself, I'm losing my mind. I'm losing my mind. I thought I saw a big red bull in the middle of that bridge, but he was there, but I got to be crazy. There was no impact. I'm... I'm I must be slipping a little bit. And she's going on for about 10 minutes just thinking, I'm, 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 I'm losing my grip mentally. And then her 10-year-old son says, Mom, how can you not say anything? She said, what do you mean? He said, what do you mean? What do I mean? He says, my stomach is in knots. She said, did you see something? He said, see something. There was a big red bull standing in the middle of the bridge. She said, you saw it? He said, Mom, we drove right through it. <laughs> Billy stops the car, 
gets out on that country road, and if you knew her, this is just her, she, she began to dance, lift her hands, and worship God, just lifted her hands, praising God. And as she was doing this, this verse came to her, Psalm 34, 7. The angel of the Lord encamps round about, forms a circle of protection round about those that fear him, and delivers them. Now, friend, that's not just a story of a story of a story that I heard. We knew Norman and Billy quite well. They spent time in our home. They were very, very dear to us. It was not a made-up story. Supernatural intervention in her life. And I know some people are thinking, well, you know, the angels must have lost my address. <laughs> or my angel must be on a permanent leave of absence. Well, they certainly only carry out God's will. But we need to understand that angels, these ministering spirits, operate within the framework of certain principles set out by God. And that they don't operate outside of the framework of those principles. And here, here's the number one, one that I see, is a reverence and a respect for God. The angel of the Lord encamps round about those who fear him. That means those that have a reverential respect and awe of God. Not those that are flippant, not those that, you know, just go their own way, but those that honestly have a reverence and a holy respect for God. Verse 9 of that same psalm says, Oh, fear the Lord, reverence and respect the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him, to those that reverence and respect him. The previous psalm, Psalm 33, verse 18. Behold, the, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, reverence and respect him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. So I think that's the first step, the, the, the first piece of framework, if you would. There needs to be a genuine reverence and a holy respect for God. Now, secondly, we, we looked last time at the fact that we just can't act presumptuously and expect angelic visitation. You can't get off on a limb and saw it off, say, well, if God's real, you know, he's going to save me before I hit the ground. You know, Jesus was on the temple, and the devil whispered to him, hey, throw yourself down, for it's written, and he quoted Psalm 91. God will give his angel charge over you. They'll bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus turned around and the devil said, it's also written, you shall not tempt or test the Lord your God. So Jesus realized that he couldn't just put the father to the test and act presumptuously and expect angelic intervention in his life. And so that's important. And then there is another thing that we're going to talk about extensively tonight that I believe is perhaps the single most significant thing we can do to cooperate with God and see his angelic intervention. I think it may be the single most important factor. If you got your Bible, look with me at Psalm 103 and verse 20. It talks about the ministry of angels here. Psalm 103, 20 says, Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. They do, that is, they fulfill, they carry out, they bring to pass his word. They heed his word. In fact, it specifically says, heeding the voice of his word. And that word voice means to be spoken aloud. They heed God's word when it is spoken aloud. And the word heed means that they are moved to action. It means to listen with a view to obey. Angels are moved to action at the voice or the sound of his word. They get busy when the word of God is spoken. And obviously, whenever God speaks, the angels are moved to action. Whenever God speaks, angels get busy fulfilling the word that he says but remember, we read in Hebrews 1 and 14 that these angels ministering spirits are sent for to minister for, to assist and aid those who will inherit salvation. 
which is us. So I'm convinced that they heed their move to action and they get busy when we speak God's word aloud as well. And when our speech harmonizes with God's word. I would encourage you to read these chapters in their entirety later on, but it's Exodus 23, chapter 32, and chapter 33. There are numerous references made by God about an angel. He told Israel that he was going to send an angel before them into the promised land to drive out all the inhabitants in the promised land and to give them victory so that they could subdue the inhabitants and that they could be planted in the land that flows with milk and honey. And again, reference after reference, God says, I'm going to send my angel, I'm going to send my angel. And in one of the references, God says this, but don't provoke the angel. What an interesting thing to say. I'm going to send this angel in. He's going to go before you. He's going to plant you everything that I promise. He's going to see that it comes to pass, but don't provoke it. And I know we all know the story. You know, that they get to the border of the promised land. They take one leader from every tribe, the 12 tribes of Israel. They send these 12 leaders, these spies, to go check out the promised land. And they go all around the land, and they come back. They bring the fruit of the land, and, and everyone gathers around. So here's the 12 spies who said, look, it's everything God said it was. Man, it is a land that flows with milk and honey. Look at the fruit. You know, it's huge. We haven't ever seen anything like it. However, there's giants there, and there's walled cities, and they're fortified, and the people are stronger than we are, and and when they looked at us, they just thought we were a bunch of little grasshoppers that they could squash, and we can't do it. It doesn't matter that God promised it. It doesn't matter that God said he'd send his angel and he'd drive out the inhabitants. It doesn't matter. We cannot do it. We're not able. We're not, it's not a possibility. We can't. And two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, they said, no, wait, 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 wait. Now remember what God promised us. We saw the same giants you saw. We saw the same walled cities you saw. We saw the same fortifications, but their defenses have departed from them. The Lord is with us. Don't fear them. They're bread for us. We're not grasshoppers. They're bread for us, and we're going to swallow them up. And all the people said, no way. And the entire nation sided with the 10 spies that spoke contrary to what God had said. Interesting, you read the story. 40 years later, only two men from that generation made it into the promised land. Guess which ones? The two whose speech harmonized with God's promises. Now, the other, you know, people, they realized they'd messed up, and then they told Moses, we're going in anyway. Moses said, don't go. The Lord's not with you. And they went in, and they were miserably defeated. Their angelic protection had departed. It wasn't there for them. They had provoked the angel by speaking contrary to what God had said. And it's interesting, in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4, citing that very story we just talked about, it admonishes us as New Testament believers not to fall after the same example of unbelief as those Israelites did who died in the wilderness. They, they spoke contrary to what God had said. And I'd like you to follow with me, if you would. Look with me in Luke chapter 1. And I, I want to take the time and read a whole lot of verses because it's just such a, a great example of what we're talking about. We're going to begin with the story of a guy named Zechariah. He's a priest. His wife's name is Elizabeth. The scripture says they were godly. You know, they, they feared God. They, they, they had those things going for them. And, and they'd been praying that she could get pregnant. And Elizabeth couldn't get pregnant. She was barren. And now they're getting up in age, and they prayed and prayed and prayed for God to be merciful and to give them a child. It's never happened. And so Zacharias is in the temple doing his duty as a priest, and suddenly 
the angel Gabriel appears to him. Now, you know, there's only two holy angels that are even mentioned by name in the Bible, Gabriel and Michael. Now, there was Lucifer. He's a fallen angel. He's now known as Satan. But there's no other angels that are given a name in all of the scriptures. And I tell you, what you read about Gabriel and about Michael in the scriptures, these angels must be some kind of specimens. Uh, they're sort of cut above all the other ranks of angels. If Gabriel appeared to you, you would know it. So here's Zacharias. He's in the, Zacharias, he's in the temple. And we pick it up in verse 11. It says, Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. So make ready, or to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. How shall I know this? Another translation, he says, how can I be sure? I mean, what else do you need? You have an archangel appearing to you. And there's a couple other translations that really catch the spirit of what he said in the original. One of them says that Zacharias responded, but this is impossible. Another one puts it this way. Do you expect me to believe this? I'm old. My wife is old. Look what happens next. Verse 19, and the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not be able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. I would say that is a provoked angel. If I don't sew your lips shut, you're going to mess thing up, this thing up. I'm not letting you say another word till this all comes to pass. Zacharias responds, you expect me to believe this? Give me a break. This is impossible. Not the best response. Now, Gabriel's pretty busy during this season. In the same chapter... We find him appearing a little while later to a young virgin named Mary. Look at her response. Chapter 1, same chapter, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and consider what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, and call his name Jesus. He'll be great, be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He'll reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? Now, that's a pretty legitimate question. All right, Gabriel, I've never been intimate with a man. I'm engaged to Joseph, and he and I have refrained. We're living holy, and you say, I'm going to have a baby. How am I going to have a baby if I don't have sex with a man? Pretty good question. The answer, 
And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who is called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Literally nothing God says will be impossible of fulfillment. Look at the next verse now. And Mary said, this is impossible. You expect me to believe this? No. Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. There's no way she could have understood. How? Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. Power of God's going to come on you. You're going to be pregnant. Okay? I don't understand it, but I agree. Let it be to me according to your word. Now, when the promises of God come to us, when God's word comes to us, when it comes to you, are you a Zacharias or are you a Mary? How do you respond? How do you respond? Zacharias, there's no way this can happen. Or Mary, I don't know how it could happen, but I believe it. I accept it. Be it unto me according to your word. Interesting. I had a friend, and he was a close friend, so I could talk to him like this. He was pretty negative most of the time. And he was like going on about another thing that had gone wrong. And I said, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. Your biggest problem is one inch below your nose. <laughs> he got kind of mad at first. But he realized that it was true. See, some people, you listen to them talk, I can't. It'll never work. It's impossible. I'll never be well. My family will never be saved. We'll never make a difference in this community. I know God has made promises concerning all of those things. Nevertheless, we can't do it. Don't let that be your response. Because what will happen is the angel and there's angels all around, is going to say, I can't work with that. <laughs> that doesn't sound like God's word to me. In fact, that's just the opposite of his promises that we sing about in heaven. That, that, I can't work with that. I move to action when I hear his word yeah. spoken aloud. You've got to give me something to work with. <clears throat> Start letting your speech harmonize with what God says. I want to agree with what God says about salvation and about the one way into a relationship with God. I want to say the same thing that he says about eternity, about forgiveness, about the fact that I'm chosen and I'm favored and I've, I'm accepted even when I don't feel like it. That he'll never leave me, he'll never forsake me, that he's a very present help in time of trouble, that he's my shield, he's my high tower, he's my deliverer, he is my healer. Let our speech harmonize with God that Jesus has defeated the enemy, and if I submit myself to God, resist the devil, he will flee from me because the scripture says that it is so. What that does is it releases the angels to work because they heed his word when it is spoken aloud. We need to give them something to work with. A really intriguing verse of scripture you might turn there, Proverbs 15 and verse 4. Proverbs 15 and 4. It says, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, 
That word wholesome literally means a tongue that speaks cure, healing, deliverance, wholeness, repair, restoration. It's actually a derivative of the word Rapha. You probably heard one of God's compound names, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our physician, the Lord, our healer. This word wholesome is actually a derivative of that word Rapha in the Hebrew language. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. What is a wholesome tongue? Listen to the New Testament, 1 Timothy 6 and 3. It says, anyone, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which, accor which accords with godliness. That tells us that wholesome words are words from the book. Scripture, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, the doctrine of the New Testament, it's called wholesome words. A wholesome tongue is a tongue that speaks God's word. But it says perverseness in it. The Amplified Bible says willful contrariness in it, speaking unhealthy negative words, literally breaks, or as Young's literal translation says, causes a breach in the spirit. Now, now, just stay with me for a minute, okay? It's, 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 I think it, this, this verse, verse is loaded. A wholesome tongue, a tongue that, that speaks God's word, that speaks health, cure, that, that, that agrees with what God says is a tree of life. But perverseness in it, a, a tongue that speaks contrary literally is a breach in the spirit. And that word spirit in the Hebrew, it's translated as God, can refer to God, can refer to wind, it can refer to the human spirit, and it's also the word that refers to angels. It's a word used for angels, Psalm 104 and verse 4, who makes his angels spirits. Now, to speak contrary to God's word causes a break in the spirit. And that word break or breach is used elsewhere in the Bible. In fact, in particular, Isaiah 30 and 13, it's a word used for a bulging place in a wall that suddenly breaks through. Now, remember we read God's angel sets this circumference, this circle of protection round about those that fear him. It's like it says in Psalms, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth, even forevermore. It's this angelic protection around us. But if I systematically and from my heart speak contrary to God's word, contrary to wholeness and healing and cure and deliverance, I create a break or a breach in that wall of protection. And Ecclesiastes 10.8 says, whoever makes a break in a wall, a serpent will bite him. Some of us have experienced the serpent's bite. My friend, tend to your words. Proverbs says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those that indulge in it, they'll experience life or they will experience death. Let your speech begin to harmonize with God's word. We had a wall, a retaining wall by our house. And I noticed one day there was a crack in it. I thought, I'm going to get to that. A few weeks later, I noticed the crack was bigger. I thought, I'm going to get to that. A few weeks later, I noticed the, the top brick on the wall had fallen off. I set it aside. I said, I'm going to get to that. I looked at it a few weeks later, and it was bulging out a little more. And I thought, mm, yeah, eventually. And then I went out there one day and several of the cinder blocks had fallen out of the wall. There was a hole in the wall. So I got somebody else to fix it. <laughs> and somebody came over and they repaired my wall. The thing is, if you've just got a little breach in your wall, and I know, I know some of us, we were raised in a home, everything was negative in the home whether it was a conversation about politics, about the weather, about friends, about relatives, negative, negative, negative. Some of you, that's the environment you're raised in, but it can stop with you. Yeah. You can change 
and let your tongue begin to harmonize with Scripture. And some of you, you got a bulge in your wall. Some of you, the crack's gotten pretty wide. Some of you are missing a few blocks out of the wall. And just about anything can slither through there. I'm just trying to help you get your wall fixed tonight. We want to get our wall fixed. We want to give the angel something to work with. And the surest way to put God's word on our lips is to first put them in our hearts. Proverbs twenty-two seventeen 17 says, Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge. Verse 18, For it is a pleasant thing if you keep them within you. Let them all be fixed upon your lips. If we keep his word within us, it will be fixed on our lips. The way to have his word fixed on our lips is first to have it fixed in our heart. You know, in Ezekiel, God told Ezekiel to speak his word to the people. But first, in a vision, he says to Ezekiel, eat the scroll with my words on it. Fill, feed your belly and fill your stomach with the scroll that I give you. And then afterward, God says, now speak my words to the people. Eat it before you speak it. Feed on my words, and then they will be in your lips. Jeremiah 15 and 16 says, your words were found, and I ate them. Revelation chapter 10, the angel has John eat the book before he prophesies. You know, I walked upstairs in the office this evening before I came downstairs, and one of the gals in the office smelled like onions. And she made a joke about it, and I, I actually noticed the smell. It was pretty strong. She'd been cooking with onions all day. And it made me think, you know, I like garlic. I just really do. I like raw garlic. I like cooked garlic. I like garlic a lot. And if I eat garlic, everybody knows it. <laughs> my wife knows it, family knows it, my friends know it. If you got close enough to have a conversation with me, you would know it because I would have garlic breath. What I'm talking to you about tonight is getting scripture breath. <laughs> Feed on his word. If you just do that, the, the speech part takes care of itself. Some of your friends are going to hear you talk and they say, what has gotten into you? You're going to say, God's word has gotten into me. So you don't talk the same. You're not negative like you used to be. You know, you, you, you're just, you're quoting the Bible all the time. And your friends won't be the only ones that will be made aware the angels will be made aware as well. Some of you got your personal angel. He's been walking around with his hands in his pockets for 25 years. <laughs> and all of a sudden, what? What did she say? <laughs> yeah, keep going. Say it again. Say it again. I can work with that. You think I'm kidding, I'm not. They hearken to the voice of his word. They're, they're moved to action when God's word is spoken aloud. I read the biography of John Patton some time back. Patton was a missionary mid through the late 1800s to what is now known as the Republic of Vanuatu. A, an archipelago of islands in the, the South Pacific. And uh, at the time he was there, they were still practicing, the indigenous people were still practicing cannibalism. They were quite violent. And he, he brought the gospel there and uh, spent many, many years of his life, you know, doing his best to win people to Christ. And there was a, a season when on one of the other islands there, one of the other major islands some missionaries there had been killed by the locals and word spread to the other islands and it sort of incited everyone else. And so on, on the island he was working, a whole bunch of the indigenous people came one night to the little mission station they had. They, they had a home that was built 
little church built next to it, and a whole bunch of, of natives there, they were armed, came, they burned the church down, and there was this little thatch fence that connected the church and the house, and uh, it caught fire, and the fire is racing towards the house. And Patton and his wife, and there was a couple other people inside, were praying. They were praying the promises. Praying promises of protection. Like the Psalm 91 promises that we just read. You know, the, the, that, that God gives his angels charge of you to keep you in all your ways. And Psalm 34, that the angel, you know, encamps round about those that fear him and delivers them. They're praying the promises. And Patton walks outside and tries to kick down this thatch wall before it gets to the house. And he's surrounded by seven or eight guys and they're going to kill him. And this bold, divine boldness comes on him. He points his finger at them and rebukes them and begins to speak judgment on them. And all of a sudden, this like gale force wind came from behind him and blew the fire away from the house. And then the heavens opened and this torrential downpour, I mean, like in moments happened, put the whole fire out. All of the aggressors ran away. And they said in the biography, they said it was God's angelic intervention that saved our lives that night. Now, I read another article. It wasn't part of the biography, but read something that someone had written sometime later, sort of an addendum to the story, said that Patton had met one of the guys. He was sort of, I think, one of the sub-chiefs that was there that night to kill him and to kill his wife, to burn the house down. And he'd come to Christ. He'd come to faith in Christ. And so he's talking to him. He says, you know, the night when you and all the men came, you know, and you burned the church and you were going to kill us, why didn't you kill us? I know you were intent on killing us. And he said, well, there were so many armed men surrounding your house, we were afraid. Patton said, there was no armed men at our house. So yes, there was. There was men with swords at your house. And we were afraid. And that's actually why we left. Angelic protection. But it's to me, yeah, thank God. To me, it's just so significant that, that in that biography, you know, written about them, and I think it was written in, in probably the, the, somewhere between 1910 and maybe 1930, when it was written, but their time there had taken place in the, the mid to late 1800s, that there's just that little sentence there. They said this was God fulfilling his promises. It was his angels responding to faith in his promises. I want to read one more passage to you tonight, if I might. It's an interesting story found in 2 Kings chapter 6. And I know we've, we've read quite a few verses tonight, but it's a story of the king of Syria. He's trying to attack Israel, but everywhere he goes, the Israel military outflanks him. They're already waiting for him. And he says, there's a spy. He calls them in together and says, who's the spy? Somebody's telling the king of Israel where we're going to be. And they say, no, it's the prophet Elisha. He's, he's prophesying to the king and telling him by you know, the spirit where you're going to be before you're there. He knows the words you speak in your bedchamber at night. And so he inquires, finds out that Elisha's at a city called Dothan. He says, all right, we're going to get him. We're going to take that chess piece off the board, and then we're going to attack. And so he sends his army to Dothan, and we pick it up in 2 Kings chapter 6. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I want to stop. Imagine there's Elisha and his servant standing on top of some building. Servant looks at Elisha and says, there's more with us. All right. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 
8,000, 9,000, 10,000, one, two. There's more with us than there are with them. Look what happens next. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. If you could only see the angelic hosts that are around you all the time. You know, opening the young man's eyes did not create all those angels and the fiery chariots in the hill. They were already there. He just couldn't see them. Elisha knew it by faith, and we need to accept it by faith. If God opens our eyes, hallelujah, oh, happy day, that would be a fun thing. But they're there whether we can perceive them or not, just like the Internet signals and the radio signals and the television signals going through this room. My friend, there's, I'm quite sure there's probably way more angels in here tonight than there are people. You seen these two big bruisers behind me on the platform? <laughs> Hi, guys. Yeah, they're with me everywhere I go. I don't see them, but I believe they're there. And they're called to minister for those will be heirs of salvation. Those who embraced Jesus Christ, the purpose of the angels is to assist and to help and to lift up and to guard those who inherit salvation. Now, if you've never inherited salvation, if you've never said yes to Jesus Christ, let me give you an opportunity to do it right now. You bow your heads, close your eyes for a minute. I don't think it's a coincidence we're here tonight. In fact, I am quite sure that there are people in this room that have had supernatural experiences that you cannot explain. Something happened to you when you were a child and you shouldn't be here, but you're here. Or something happened to you in your automobile and you, you shouldn't be here and all of a sudden the car just righted itself. Or some other event happened, or suddenly you sensed a presence that was there that you couldn't explain. I talked to people after the service last Wednesday night. A number of people had had supernatural encounters. It would be cool if we could hear all the stories because I'm sure there's a lot here. But the most important thing is to move from just having a reverence for God to having an obedience to God and saying yes to the gospel. God so loved the world, we were singing it a few minutes ago, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish, but would have eternal life. It's a gift that has to be received. God won't force it on you, but you have to take it. The scripture says, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God, the sons and the daughters of God. I want to pray a simple prayer with you tonight. If you've never made your peace with God, if you've never said yes to Jesus Christ and the salvation that he brought through his death, burial, and resurrection, if you open your heart to him tonight, my friend, God's spirit will visit you and will change you. And it's not about rules and regulations. It's not about ritual and ceremony. It's about having a relationship. Right now, everybody in the house, just put a hand on your heart if you would. We're going to pray. I'm going to give you some words, but they don't mean anything if you don't put a sincere heart behind them. Tie your heart around these words and speak them to God. Just say, oh God. Oh God, I come to you 
with all of my heart, I come to you tonight. I know I need you. And I do believe Jesus is your son. I believe you sent him to die for the world. And tonight I'm making a choice. A choice that I know will change everything. I'm going all in. And I'm saying yes to Jesus Christ. Jesus, come into my life. I put my trust in you. Be my Lord and be my Savior. It's in your precious name I pray. Amen. Fantastic. Now, I'd like the band to come out if they would. We're going to do something. And I, I was praying this afternoon about this juncture in the service, and I just felt like we can do something. The band's just going to play softly. We're going to pray for one another. And I know there's a lot of people out here. You're word people. You're a word guy. You're a word gal. You've got the word in your heart. And we're just going to make little groups of three, maybe four people. And if you've got the word in your heart, I want you to pray the word. Make your, your, your prayer full of the word. Pray a word prayer. Angels hearken. They, they're moved to action when God's word is spoken aloud. Let's be Mary's in our response to God's promises, not like Zacharias, but just say, okay, be it to me according to your word. And in your group, if you've got a need, it may be, you're battling with an illness. Maybe you grapple with depression. Maybe you're worried about your kids. Maybe you're out of a job, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have to give the, the whole history of it, but just let it be known what it is. And then someone in the group, if you've got the word in you, pray the word. And if there's nobody in your group that's got the word abiding in them, well, we read that you know, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy. So, baby, that's the next best thing. Just have a reverence, reverence for God and just pray for mercy. If there's nobody in the group right now that can pray a scripture or that knows a promise that covers that need, and then just determine that you're going to begin to feed on God's word, just like Ezekiel did, just like Jeremiah did, just like John did. They ate the words of the book, and then they spoke them. Determine you're going to be a person of the book. And we're going to pray some short, hot prayers, not for a long time. We're not going to be here a long time. But just maybe we'll spend the next five minutes praying. And I believe that as we sincerely pray, and especially as we take hold of a promise, that angels are going to be moved to action. Some things that have been sort of a log jam for a long time, it's going to be an angel going to kick that log jam loose and you're going to see things begin to change, things begin to happen. Are you ready? Yeah. Just stand to your feet if you would. And of course, if you just want to be a spectator, no harm, no foul, go ahead and find some people around you and let's pray for each other. Come on, let's just do it. Take a couple of minutes. Let's pray some short, hot prayers full of the Word of God.